Good morning. We are here today for our annual International Symposium on Human Identification videos, and we have Bruce Bedole with us. Bruce, why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Well, I'm, I'm uh, it's an interesting question in itself. I can't remember <laughs> these days, given the sheltered in approach, we forget what, who we are and what we're doing. But um, I have a doctorate in genetics. Uh, I did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Alabama in Birmingham in both cancer and diabetes research. And then from there, I went to the FBI, started out as a research scientist developing new methods for identifying genetic markers in obviously crime scene type evidence. Uh, and I left the FBI as the senior scientist of the laboratory division in 2009 and went to Texas. And I'm now the director for the Center for Human Identification at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. Excellent. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing there, particularly in regard to identifying missing persons? Well, we have a, a, a rather unique situation that we are a recognized crime laboratory in the state of Texas. We manage the missing persons database, as, as you have just alluded to, uh, in part of your questions. But also, we, we do traditional casework. Well, we're also being at a university, being in a unique situation, we also are a CODIS laboratory so that we can upload and do searches in CODIS to, um, to help uh, develop investigative leads, help solve crime, identify missing persons. We have a research facility, so we're one of the few unique labs in the U.S. that do research and casework. And being at a university, we also teach and train students and people from the community, uh, professionals that uh, seek help in this area. Now in the missing persons area, obviously, we are the missing persons lab for the state of Texas, but also through funding from the National Institutes of Justice, we provide this service to the rest of the country for free to identify, help identify missing persons. We'll do the DNA typing, sometimes some anthropological work to help develop associations that medical examiners and other um, medical legal uh, professionals can use to help identify the missing persons. Wow, that's really remarkable. I imagine um, you've come across many different types of cases doing this work. What are some of the challenges associated with identifying missing persons? Well, some of these are the same as any other case. You have often uh, limited materials. Uh, most of the time we'll have bones. Bones have been exposed to the environment. The DNA will be degraded may have chemicals that inhibit the PCR process. There's a large amount of microbial uh, materials in there that can impact our success rates. The other thing about with missing persons is that we often need family members to help identify the individuals. It's not the typical crime scene case where you have um, a blood stain, let's say, and then a suspect that you compare one to one, either someone who's been arrested or is a person of interest or through a database search, we need family members to reconstruct the potential um, individual that may have been a family member of that, of that family and then see if this unknown remains fits that potential individual or set of individuals. So now we have a different problem is finding those uh, family members that can provide the proper genetic information to help us identify that individual. Absolutely. Well, and that sort of segues right into the talk that you gave. You talked about, uh, you were on a panel with for, uh, talking about forensic genealogy and its applications, um, in particular in cold cases, but I mean, forensic genealogy has been all over the news and people are using it in all kinds of different ways. Uh, why do you think it's a powerful tool? Well, uh, in what some senses, we've been doing forensic genealogy. Missing persons is a forensic genealogy approach. Uh, our typical approach is we take the DNA, we generate an STR profile, as we all know, and we search a database and we look for a direct match. And at times, there are no direct matches that are obtained. In fact, a good percentage of the time, anywhere from, depending on what stats you use, 50 to 70 percent of the time, in the United States, we're not going to get a hit by using a database search. Typically, uh, our database searches are CODIS. When those happen, there are some techniques such as familial searching, which says, okay, we don't have a direct match, but are there individuals in the database that look similar, that they may be the relative, the true donor of the biological sample found at the crime scene? You identify some individuals that might fit that, 
Then you do the typical uh, search with other records and information to see if that individual has a relative that could be the source of the evidence. So that's one way of doing it. Another way is to use YSTR typing, which has been very successful in cases in Arizona. Colleen Fitzpatrick did a very nice uh, investigation and identified the, the true, helped identify the true perpetrator of that crime. The, the Dutch in, uh, had a, a, a dragnet approach that they did where they identified the individual by using YSTRs instead of any other approach. And now we have this other one that's been known as investigative genetic genealogy, what most people are thinking of today, in which we use dense SNP panels, basically scanning the entire genome and having millions of markers in theory that could be used to extend your reach into the potential relative of the source of the material. When we do traditional familial searching or parentage testing, missing persons, we're often looking at a first degree relative. If we can extend beyond that, we have more leads that can help us identify the individual. Genetic genealogy, as what you, you, you're thinking about and what most of the talks at this meeting are about, extends out to beyond the first degree relative, second, third, fourth, maybe even up to six, seven, eight generations away, and opens up the potential if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and do the post-investigation that's non-genetic at that point, or in part non-genetic. You know, that's, yeah, that's absolutely, it's so fascinating and watching it over the last few years and where it's, where it's gone and where it has the potential to go. Were there any surprising questions that came up in the workshop? What are people talking about these days? It wasn't as so much surprising ones because all of us that are involved, and of course I was on a workshop with a, with a very good group of people like Barbara Ray Venter and Steve Kramer and James Arnstead who are all working in the area as well. So we've, we've probably heard all these questions before, but some of them are the typical, how much DNA do you need? What are some of the challenges in getting DNA out of materials like bones and so forth? What are the legal issues around it? What are the ways to challenge it if you were a defense attorney in there, the validation or validity of it? So in some ways, not so different than any of the other advances we've had where people ask the same sort of things. It's just an interesting one because this is outside of the realm of the crime lab for most laboratories, and it's out in the private sector doing the work. So now we have this powerful tool that in a lot of ways is rivaling, and if not surpassing some of our traditional methods like CODIS and others, help solve, in particularly those challenging cases and cold cases that have not had any resolution to date. Okay. What do you think the future looks like? Future. I know we're asking you to guess, but... <laughs> oh, you know, it's always good to, to say, say with a crystal ball because if you predict out far enough, then I won't be around anymore, so that doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong. <laughs> now, the, the future it looks good and, and rosy in a lot of ways because we have more tools. And it's not about one tool is better than another or one's going to replace another. It's we have more tools. We can answer questions. And if we take a sort of a systematic approach of saying, here's the case we have, here's the type of materials, here's the question we need to answer. What's the best tool to help us do that? And if we take that approach, we're gonna solve more cases. And that's our job, is to help solve cases, identify those who may be the source of the evidence, and at the same time, exonerate or exculpate those who are wrongly associated with the evidence. And, and to me, another tool that does that and is powerful is always welcome. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, a question that's a little bit off topic, but this was the first year that Ishi was virtual, um, given the pandemic. So uh, how did you find it? We're at the end of the week. What did you think? Well, in, in some ways, it, it was quite good because you could pick and choose when you wanted to, to go to a talk. And so the timing was good. Usually when at the meeting, someone's always pulling me aside and saying, I want to talk to you about something. Can we meet now? And it's in the middle of the talk. So you don't get the chance to really enjoy everything. Here you can say, okay, it's 5 a.m. in the morning. No one's going to bother me. I'm going to listen to all the talks. That side's good. On the other side, there is something about human contact. And oh, yeah. being face to face with somebody that you can't achieve, even with uh, all the great tools we have, such as GoToMeetings or you know, Teams or Zoom and such. And so you don't get that kind of dynamic interaction on uh, discussions and say, I've got a great idea, what do you think? So that's, I think, was lost in this meeting that you didn't have. 
But on the other hand, it made it more convenient and accessible. And it, largest group ever. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, we had a workshop the, the, several days before we had close to 900 people in a workshop. Almost impossible if you think about it in the, in the other venues. So there's some values. In our own work, we found that these meetings actually approach to the virtual meeting may be a better way to teach than what we thought. So we're doing a lot of training in Central America on developing DNA capacity and databases to combat human trafficking and violent crime. And what we would do is we said, we're going to do a workshop. We're going to come in and we're going for the whole week train you on DNA extraction and typing and interpretation. It's quite overwhelming to do it all in one week. And so they get overwhelmed. They get this data overload. Plus, they have all their work that they're taken away from. And now it's all building up. So when it's done, you have to go back to work and catch up. It doesn't, you don't actually effectively train the people. And now what we're doing is once every week or every two weeks, we do a two-hour lecture. They absorb it better. There's far more questions. And when they follow up, they're asking deep detail because they were able to, to enjoy it, appreciate it, and think about it. So there may be some real value in maintaining some of this virtual approach because we may be more effective in getting our messages across than the way we always thought was better. It's really fascinating. I feel I'm really appreciating how much we're learning, uh, you know, by force. I wouldn't ask for this, but um, trying to make the best of it and finding new ways and making things more accessible. It's, yeah, it's kind of remarkable. Well, you know, it's just like science and anything. When you see a challenge, you try to find a way to overcome it, you know, uh, whatever it may take. And this was just a challenge and we're finding ways to overcome it to get back to whatever the new normal the saying is. <laughs> the reality is, is we'll be using these tools far more so and maybe more effectively than we have in the past without them. Yes, it'd be wonderful to be using the tools and see people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anything else we missed? Anything else you're working on you'd like to talk about? Well, we are working on uh, our own uh, methods to uh, deal with these very challenged samples. So, you know, uh, we'll probably be one of the labs that is going to bring on the, the uh, whole genome sequencing for our work. You know, we're in the process of obtaining a NovaSeq as we speak so that we can do that work. We're also looking at other methods to um, reduce the size of the applicons that you generate during PCR to be able to type very challenged samples and work in our lab with a, a company called Nimogen. I don't know if you've heard of them. They mm -hmm. developed a one-step uh, library preparation and with them we co-designed a panel of SNPs that are 50 bases in, in size. That's the, about the shortest you can ever get with a SNP. Basically you're right up at, at, at the SNP itself. And we were able in our first study to identify SNPs in a thousand year old bones from Kings of Aragon. So now we want to pursue the, this technology further for our type of work, which is highly degraded samples. And we're very optimistic, so we're going to um, create a panel of about 80 SNPs and uh, have some power that's equivalent to an STR panel to address the same kind of things that we traditionally do in a manner that feeds into the, pro into the system. The nice thing about it is not only does it work with degraded samples and exploits PCR for sensitivity, you put everything into the tube and you close it and you walk away and it does all the library prep. So there's no sample manipulations and moving around. And so it, it's all done in one day, but it's also done without a lot of hands-on. So this is another one of those approaches. Other things, we're still looking at new materials and swabs and things to collect evidence and release DNA. So they may not sound as exciting, but they're just as critical. So, you know, we've been doing a lot of work with Copan and companies like that that produce that. We're also always eager in new kits that come out. Um, you know, um, we, we just finished uh, validating a, a mitochondrial DNA sequencing panel for the whole genome that uses less DNA than we did traditionally with Sanger sequencing. And we see that there's a new capillary electrophoresis instrument now on the market spectrum that might be of interest to look at as well. So there's always new things that could improve our process. And we're going to keep seeking them as much as we can to um, try to do a better job. It's a dynamic and exciting field. It's really been fun to watch the progression over the years. So we'll have to keep talking to you. I'm sure we will be uh, you know, wanting to do another video next year to hear the latest. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll do it in person. 
Oh, that would be amazing. Awesome. That would be amazing. Bruce, thank you. You are always so gracious to join us. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure and an honor. This is my, I guess I've been, been probably the only person who's been to all of the uh, issue conferences since day one. So I have to show up or I'll break my record. I, we, yes, we, we would not allow that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thank you very much. You have a great day. Thank you, Laura, and you too. Take care. <laughs>